The Cinema Snobs 1983 in film is here in its near four and a half hour entirety, people. Relive all the magic of 3D films, Conan and Mad Max knockoffs, Cold War shenanigans, two James Bond films, four Tom Cruise films, and let's not forget about the raunchy teen comedies. That's what we're here for today, after all. Click on the link in the comments and in the description and support our giant year-in-review retrospectives. And of course, whenever we finish one supersized year in review, we have to spotlight some individually that perhaps stuck out the most, or at the least were referenced the most. So sit back for a month of some 1983 double feature episodes. As I sit in front of a bunch of posters from 1962. When one year retrospective ends, another begins. So coming soon, it's 1962 in film. We all know those classic gags from zany comedies, like what? What's a camera doing in the girls' room? We've seen it from King Frat, to Revenge of the Nerds, to Fraternity Vacation, to American Pie, but those are usually just one scene. Getting it on bumps that up to the fact that it's the entire plot. It's like watching School Spirit and the Invisible Kid and saying, whatever, those movies only have had one part where they were invisible in the showers. Give me 90 minutes of someone just standing in the locker room and staring. The 80s were all about starting up businesses, and boy do these teens know how to do that. They secretly record the girls and sell the footage. Shut up and take my money, and don't tell anyone! Getting It On was the brainchild of the late William Olson, who wrote and directed the film, and got his start doing camera work on stuff in the 70s, like Trucker's Woman and Hot Summer in Barefoot County. He then graduated up to director with some 80s sexploitation flicks, with Getting It On being his first full-length feature, then followed that up with Rock and Road Trip and After School. His last movie was in 97 and called Southern Bells, which, looking at it, I'm like faith-based movie or Skinamax. This could go either way, and that's rare. You know you're in an 80s comedy when I skip to a random part to make sure that the copy is okay, and then this happens. <laughs> Fairness could also be a slasher film. If you find the concept confusing, it'll break out the dictionary. Voyeur. One. A person who habit habitually seeks stimulation. Yes, it is highbrow cinema when the movie opens with a definition. The opening makes a little more sense when you find out that the original title that it was shot under was American Voyeur. No time to ask who that was talking. Already our hero, Alex, is sneaking out of the house to find fresh new victims to kill. Someone invent internet porn, please. He has to hide his binoculars so he can watch hoo 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 hot lamp action. Mmm, yes, stick a potato in the socket. Damn. Welp, guess you better go home now. Ah, oh, what the hell? Son, if you don't stop this very complicated plan to see some boob, you're not going to get enough sleep for the big test tomorrow. Don't you have a spank bank? The important thing is he's not waking up the entire neighborhood. Are you okay? No. Wait and let me come help. I know first aid. Wow, it really was easy to be a serial killer back then. And this is what happened when Lorraine and George McFly met before Marty pushed him out of the way. It's okay, they address the spying. You were spying on me, weren't you? You know, that's pretty immature. Are you the new girl Marilyn was showing around at school today? Uh-huh. Enough of that old peeping Tom thing. So what's the weather like tomorrow? It's nice to see Alex get to know the new neighbor, Sally. He needs some company. Dadney Coleman never pays him any attention and is always on his breakfast phone. You can see the budget in a lot of places, but the director did work his ass off in raising money for the flick, and he cast actors out of New York, some of which, like lead Martin Yost, this was his only film. It's a movie all about business. Well, Dad, just remember, everything is cyclical. That stock will come back up eventually. Uh, you're gonna fill my leg lamp, aren't you? It's important to me. 
Alex pitches dad his new business, inspired by security cameras at the mall. This is like watching an episode of Doug if he put down the comics, grabbed a bottle of lotion, and still daydreamed. So you want to invest, eh? How much you think you need to get started? Well, we might just be able to let you in on this. I guess he wants to be in the Mafia, too? But just because he hasn't told his dad exactly what he wants the cameras for. But you agree to pay 15% interest with payment on the principal after 90 days? Sure. It's a deal. Doesn't mean that dad isn't instantly suckered in by the con man in his own home. I do like that some of these lines make it seem like an 80s business satire in a teen comedy world. Yeah, Kathy, now this is Alex Carson. Uh, will you raise my credit card limit to 12000 please? Now, granted, that's dropped pretty quickly, as a lot of it is funny just for being dated. Like when we meet best friend Nick, who gets in trouble at school for, you know, the usual tomfoolery. What kind of a normal? God-fearing young man would derive pleasure from passing around pictures of his, his genitals to a girl's typing class. In this school, we send dick pics to the substitute teacher. It's less likely you'll see them again. I like how the principal is the asshole for saying, you can't show your dick to the students. I mean, what else is Nick supposed to do? What is the proper introduction to the male sex organ, Mr. White? We don't have sex education. We have health class. And besides, Miss Barton's an old lesbian. Nick is more of a Skinamax lesbian fan. He actually says, just one more time and you're in real trouble. And to make matters worse, his daughter Marilyn is dating Nick's no good brother Richard. Oh, it's hard being a principal. Can't call the police now though. It's only 10 minutes in and we already have a starting up the business montage. I laugh, but this song will be stuck in my head for the next several years. I'm watching my video. Oh, oh, watching my video. How this wasn't used for every commercial jingle for every video store ever built is beyond me. It's like watching Risky Business if the real risk was that the girls didn't know they were part of Joel's business and later ended up in a shallow grave. Wait, drinking and driving? These boys are just asking to have the cuffs slapped on them by McGruff. I know how to get some money. Sell the car to that Wayne kid from the public access show. Well, 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 up to official buttercreamer business, are you? That's right, Mom's gonna be washing all the socks tonight. And to make matters more dangerous, Satan sold them his giant satellite which is gonna zap Alex right into all the adult channels he creates. Now the movie is weird science if they gave up and just bought a blow-up doll. Dear Frustrated, tell your husband there will be no more eating in till he learns to eat out. <laughs> Quiet, you idiot. The replicant is almost ready. and Don't embarrass me in front of my mom. <laughs> Your mom's gonna bang your friend, bro. Now for the real research. Thank God the ladder is still out. Why, if there's a ladder in the neighborhood, you have to set up hidden cameras. Come on back, let me see it. He had to add the sexy silk stockings music himself. Then the filmmakers realize Alex's camera angles suck. Let's just go in the bathroom ourselves. The entirety of his plan relies heavily on everyone only being naked in front of their window and nowhere else. I like how in 1983, every comedy was a little like joysticks. See? There is an arcade. Man, when I get rolling, I'm gonna have tapes of the prettiest naked girls in town. Hell, I could see that at the adult bookstore. Good job putting a hole in his entire plan. Will someone please acknowledge that they talk strictly with their blue balls? He wants to know if you, uh, if you, um, get it on. What do you mean, get it on? You know, fool around. Well, be specific. Never mind, Marilyn. I'll see you boys later. Why are people acting like any of these conversations are normal? She even tells him, say, I like those Polaroids you sent to the girls. And even aside from the sending pictures of his junk, Nick is a little much. So, what time tonight? Nine o'clock? Okay, boy, what an exciting night! <laughs> 
the dick pics I can handle. The sitcom overacting, however, tone it down, son. Sure, he could stop by and actually talk to Sally, but daydreaming is much easier. I'm so glad you stopped by. I just can't get my mind off of you. And then he travels to Aspen to return her Samsonite briefcase. Just kidding, it's for the best she's not alone with Alex. Look what happens when he's just watching a movie. It's the third time you've seen that. Oh, come on, it was near the part where the girl gets raped by the slug from Pluto. Don't worry, Mom, he's not a sex offender. He's just writing an internet review for the movie. That's why Mom made sure to hide the cord whenever he tries calling anyone. Hello, Sally? I'm talking to you from a can. Mom hid the cord again. She might be one of my favorite characters. This is what happens when he asks her to a movie. Well, what's on? I don't know. I forgot to look. Well, look and then call me back, dumbass. That was good delivery, but brace yourself for the most dated thing in it. Uh, how about Revenge of the Jedi? Hey, that sounds good. Ooh, it's an alternate universe where Revenge of the Jedi is playing in theaters. We'll be right back. How about you look up some showtimes for that hilarious new comedy, American Voyeur? And if you feel the need to get those cameras out of the bedroom and instead would prefer a giant pillow, our friends at Loading Crew Crafts are now doing pre-orders on this spectacular Cinema Snob Daki Makura pillow. Click on the links below and now you can wear a onesie while sleeping with me in a onesie. Ooh, ooh wording. Now that we're back... <laughs> Wait till you hear! Tell me about it! Boys, you're both losers! There's moments of creativity here, like the split screen where she's on the phone with her friend and it syncs up with Alex and Nick's conversation. Do you think she knows you're up to something? Sally? I don't know. I think he's up to something, but... Eat your heart out, Blade Runner. Top this ambitious editing. I'm a little curious about these movies they keep watching. This one seems even lower budgeted than getting it on. They couldn't even afford the killer worm costume. But Alex has his first date. The boys are growing up. So you're really gonna give it a go, huh? Yep. I think it's about time I got serious with old Sal. Anyway, point the camera at her window. She's gonna be good naked tonight. I, for one, blame the parents. No, really. Mom walks in and sees their footage playing, yet is more interested in his magazines because it might spice up the bedroom. You know, when our son goes to prison, we'll have plenty of alone time. Hell, his dad walks in and catches him watching it like he's just simply watching a TV commercial or something. Best give him the talk now that he knows he's into sex. You know, if we were, if we were caught with a magazine like that, we... Uh, we were really ashamed. The hidden camera footage, however, that's on the up and up. You're good, son. God, it's like if American Pie were about Ted Bundy. Hurry up with this father-son bonding moment. The shenanigans music has arrived and there's not a moment to lose. <laughs> He's going to short sheet the bed, isn't he? Haha, <laughs> nope. Hidden camera in his brother's closet. Classic. If Sally didn't have it bad beforehand, her locker is next to the roller skating punks from the Warriors. Not to mention, their cameras have infiltrated the schools. Look, there's the boom mic. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Back to the plot. Are you as surprised as me no one has asked why we haven't attended a single class yet? Poor Alex has some competition, though. A jock old enough to be the football coach. He's gonna be so sad. Don't play that music like I'm supposed to feel sorry for him! Anyway, as the store hangs up a stupid joke, time to steal more porno. I admire that scenes in the movie can still escalate quickly. Why don't you men steal it from me? Nothing, Mr. Asian. You lion shit. You even French and I'll open you up. You get it, punk? <laughs> That'll teach him to overact in the store again. I love how this is slight overkill for this crime, but not overkill for everything else he's done. But if you don't know how to end the scene... Just use the stinger at the end of the 1983 in film episode. Hell, many of these scenes are prime stinger material. Tom, honey, 
You know, I've watched every episode of Magnum P.I. Yes, but if you were a true Selleck fan, you would have been there for High Road to China. I love high school movie logic. They didn't call the police on Nick. They called his principal. I got Bueller right where I want him. It's been a while since we've had some music, though. Do you mind turning that down? It doesn't fit the scene, and no one in this has good intentions. This is Richard, Nick's brother, who we finally see. Wow, Chuck Cunningham is alive after all. Aren't you gonna help your brother? Arrested by the principal? Your ass is grass, baby. Serves you right for using a fake ID that says McRapin. Never mind Alex casually watching Richard and Marilyn have sex. <laughs> He's fine. The principal is here to drop off Nick and say that he's expelled. Stealing a porno magazine not on school grounds is what expelled him, and not the sexual assault. But they figured out how to copy it to a tape. Hoo hoo! They're acting like a sex film after school special. Now's a good chance to see the tape. It's got TNA. Tits and ass, wait up. You guys gotta cough up a buck each. And then you can have this copy of Porky's 2 the next day. We got a top loader, too. That's when you know it'll last decades. It would have been funnier if they were sitting there all horny, and then it cuts to them watching the Care Bears or some shit. Uh-oh, where is this going? That was the school equipment, and there's a big TV on stage. Mr. Steptoe is here to teach them all about business and selling. Can we just get to the part where the tapes are accidentally mixed up? It isn't just someone changing clothes. They straight up play Richard and Marilyn's hidden camera sex tape. Don't worry, years later they'll show footage of him dying in the war. I love you. America. Like that film, best keep it playing without anyone shutting it off. Dude, this will be good for business. Now let's go about our day like that didn't just happen. And while Nick is being sent to a different school, no joke, he still has to stay at this one for a week before the paperwork goes through. So now Alex has to come up with a plan to make sure Nick doesn't leave. How do I invent a phone booth that travels through time? Eh, screw it. Daydream about beating up the jock. She's with me now. Understand? God, I hope this ends tragically and he drives away crying like in Last American Virgin. This movie is 96 minutes long and really should have been about 80. You can tell what scenes could be trimmed, as in all of them. I don't know how much I need to see dinner being prepared and eaten, though the scene does at least establish his age. Oh, uh, who's pushing? He's 14 years old. Hell, when I was 14. No, please. Nice try. He's still being tried as an adult. Now that we're caught up to the pillow fight scene, Alex gets ready for his big date with Sally. Now he knows to bring her a bouquet of feathers when he picks her up. This scene has nothing to do with anything and makes less sense in the movie than it did when I isolated it earlier. I bet the first date action will be even hotter. My god, Alex. Are you, are you ready? Uh, well, yeah. Okay. Ooh, dripping with sexual chemistry. Just wait until the car ride. Alex, I cannot breathe with you sitting so close. Oh, thank you, Daydream. I can go to my happy place where we bang. See? He does have a spank bank. Why is every shot as sinister as the lines? But you're taking me to the woods! You're driving. What? That's where the hole is dug. I ain't dragging your lifeless body across town. Now he can relax her with a bottle of booze he snuck from his dad. You won't feel a thing. Pass that drink around. We're halfway into the evening. Mmm, it isn't just sexy. It's moment by moment sexy. She just gives up and lights a cigarette right now. <laughs> they ain't gonna have sex. And Alex is an angry drunk anyway. Hey, just take me home. I wanna go home. Okay, fine, you're drunk anyway. Hey, what do you care? Alex really is the hero we deserve if we go see a movie like Getting It On. Sometimes I really can't tell the difference between Sally and Marilyn. This is Marilyn, by the way. 
I would double check to see if I mixed these characters up earlier, but I don't care that much. I don't even know who this guy is. All the characters look alike. For all I know, this is Alex and Sally going on a second date in college. Whoever he is, she bolts and gets in the car with Richard instead. I think she may have been safer with the other guy. I don't know who has a worse night. Sally has to drag drunken Alex home. And it still tries to be emotional. That winch. Oh man, I feel so bad for the guy who got drunk and called his date a wench five seconds ago. Ah, uh, thank you, hidden camera footage of my love interest. You'll never judge me. If this were any less romantic, he'd have jars of his own urine behind him. How does this still have 35 minutes left? Watching a prototype for a Zack Morris scheme shouldn't take this long. If we don't have a long, drawn-out scene of sneaking breakfast and Dad on the phone, here they are watching the pillow fight footage again. And conversations that you find in every movie like this. Well, tell me the details. Did you get your hand on it? And don't drill me about it, okay? You didn't even try to tape it. And you didn't even use the chloroform I gave you as a gift. Thank goodness they didn't forget the plot about coming up with a plan to save Nick in school. All of it hinges on the costume party. That's easy enough. Look, the camera's already placed in the party as well. Joking aside, this was one of the more difficult sequences to shoot, because the character's drug use got them thrown out of the original house they were filming in, so they had to find another and match the locations. Why on earth would anyone question the Klansman costume from Porky's 2? See, they did pass that tape around. But I have a hunch the loud music will also get them kicked out. Boom, boom, bang, bang, look out, here it comes again. You can't stop the way it flows, it never knows why. Is it too late to book Johnny Charo? I don't even know what's going on, really. One is buying a hooker. The other boys are hiding out and setting up a camera. But there are laughs sprinkled in. I like when the prostitute comes to the party and says, Hi, I'm dressed like a prostitute. The comedic timing of Terry Laughlin as the dad is pretty good throughout, even if the scenes are too long. And speaking of going on too long... <laughs> The band is seizing out again. Wait, that's Atlanta music stable Bruce Hampton with his 80s band, The Late Bronze Age. He is honestly one of the more famous names in the movie. That and that the hooker is the closest thing to Johnny Charo being in it. The actress, Kim Saunders, was actually in Another Son of Sam. Plus, the cinematographer, Austin McKinney, did work on some bigger films, like doing some camera work and effects photography on stuff like The Terminator and Escape from New York. I think I understand their plan now. They got the prostitute to seduce the principal to blackmail him. That's incredibly close to how they one-upped Principal Stuckoff in Screwballs. Only this one has the middle finger and a clan costume. Okay, be subtle with your plan, boys. Let's take a break so I can cut around the nudity in the scene. What they're teaching in private school isn't private anymore. Uh-huh. Private school. We're back to a movie whose climax is about reinstating the school sexual predator. Oh, and the romance between Alex and Sally. God damn it, movie. Give me one thing to root for. I'm rooting for Bruce here. This party is his happening and it freaks him out. It's too much plot to take in. Now Nick is hitting on Stifler's mom. I mean, the principal's wife. Mm, my husband never dresses like a Klansman. That is, until he's scandal-blocked by his brother. There are some characters I still like, like the hooker, as well as... You know, you ought to, ought to try sucking your feet in baking soda baths. You got a nerve in your foot, you know, for every major organ in your body. The friendly neighborhood cab driver who is an expert on feet. The scene still goes on. Not only do we stop to see the hooker call for another cab, but the driver continues his shtick. I'll tell you the problem. One of the problems is credit. C-R-E-I-T, credit. That's one of the problems. Am I right? Thanks, Manny McBride. I hate getting a chatty Uber driver. 
I'm seriously waiting for the slasher killer to turn up. They did just come from a costume party. While the movie may have problems, scenes still continue to escalate, even in the last ten minutes. Hello, wimp. <laughs> okay, this movie went from voyeurism comedy to blue velvet fast. I had to pause it to even comprehend what happens next. She's mine now. Understand? <laughs> Please tell me that wasn't a dream sequence. I hope to God that that really was the jock and the hero just shot him. Wait, don't cut to something else. Oh, sure, these two are happy. Did he tell her he banged a hooker? Don't worry, it airs on television as part of a book commercial from a televangelist. Honey, I'm as shocked as you are that there's nudity on religious programming. So he didn't really shoot the jock. It was just a dream. This movie really is like Bob Clark's Christmas Story set in the Bob Clark's Porky's universe. And their plan worked. That footage wasn't on the TV. It was part of a feed that they set up. So now he's properly blackmailed. Complicated! So Nick is back in school, and this did wonders for their marriage. Well, I personally want to thank you for what you've done for my husband. And we'd like to rent a camera and a monitor on our own. Gladys! This is not a happy ending! School is back to normal, the homecoming dance is a week after the big costume party, and our heroes continue getting their degree in watching girls point their asses at the camera 101. Everyone is a winner here. Guess where Richard and I are eloping to after the homecoming dance tonight? Where? Yeah, where? Des Moines, Iowa. This is good news, they'll have their reception at Fong's Pizza. I must say, this movie's not very good, but it could have worked if it was more of a parody universe like Screwballs, or really amped up being an 80s business boom satire. However, it really doesn't have any kind of point or an arc. The boys decide to film people illegally, then they do, make money, and by the end, everyone fully supports it! That said, even without them having an ounce of self-awareness, these kinds of movies are still my biggest guilty pleasures. The more a zany comedy is dated, the more I want to watch it. And in terms of dated 80s comedies, this one is neck and neck at topping private lessons. But with some funny moments, like when Dad gives Alex advice about confronting the jock at the homecoming. It's alright, I'll go with him. Alex, have you gone mad? Oh, you're right. Oh, wow. That's not the way to go about it. Here, you take it. Give me that gun. There's a surprising amount of gunplay in getting it on. Seriously, the jocks are spying on Alex and Sally so that they can confront him about taking out his best girl. Oh, shit. Would have been funnier if he shot him. Again, the better ending would be if she went off with the asshole and Alex drove away crying. But as erratic as he's driving, they're probably gonna crash anyway. And thus ends, if you think about it, really everyone loses. But as sleazy as this 1983 comedy is, there is still a sad lack of any student banging the teachers. Stick around, because my tutor is next. Now that the boys have had their videotapes confiscated by authorities, there's only one thing left to do in this town. Bang the tutor, of course! Because if the mixture of sex and business in getting it on made you say, can't we just watch Risky Business? Well, strap yourself in, because the 80s genre of sex with hot older woman, like Private Lessons, will make you reach for the Simon and Garfunkel albums, because that'll be the closest you get to watching The Graduate instead. 
Hell, 1983 alone had Class, A Night in Heaven, and this film, My Tutor. Which feels a little more like a Private Lessons follow-up than the actual Private Lessons follow-up of 83, Private School. Look, the IMDb plot says it best. A rich father hires a tutor for his son. The son is a horny teenager, and the tutor is a gorgeous blonde. Complications ensue. They bang! While this was the only film for screenwriter Joe Roberts, George Bowers, however, directed some slightly more popular movies in the 80s, such as The Hearse and the comedy Private Resort. However, his work as an editor includes acclaimed films like The Stepfather, From Hell, and A League of Their Own. And this is also highbrow entertainment. If I take my glasses off, it says Miramax Productions, though it opens with music that could be horror. Ew, don't do that kid's music with the chalkboard! This is a sex comedy! There! You are tardy, funky porno music! Here we meet our hero, Bobby, sitting in class like, Oh my god, oh my god, I hope they don't notice I'm clearly an adult who snuck into the school. I joke, but I kind of like this catchy-ass opening. It's going full Toxic Avenger opening. Already I like this better than getting it on. I have a hunch it's a nod to physical. The star, Matt Latanzi, was married to Olivia Newton-John, and he was in the physical music video, plus he was in Xanadu, and not Grease, but was in Grease too. The 80s was a time when if you went to go work out, it would indeed turn into a music video. Hell, this kick and disco theme makes me want to exercise and get a tutor at 41 years old. See, even the speaker of the house is getting in on these funky beats. Bobby is having trouble at school. The disco theme plays on all the loudspeakers. He can't help but picture B-roll footage from the Jamie Lee Curtis Travolta film Perfect. Room for one more, ladies? My chest hair will be glistening by the end. This sequence is going on for a long time, which I'm sure is intentional. And I'm sure I don't care. Axel from Friday the 13th, the final chapter, will be watching this on repeat during his night shift and cause a paradox because Crispin Glover is in this too. It's also better made than getting it on, in that the picture is at least a lot clearer. Getting it on looked like they were selling the movie itself out of the back of their car. And now we know why Bobby is having trouble in school. But he has his friends. Hey you, get your damn hands off my van. See, George didn't disappear when Marty pushed these two out of the way. He just turned into Ducky is all. This is the theatrical feature debut of Crispin Glover, who plays Jack, keeping an eye out for those on campus who aren't undercover officers. Bobby, I've been looking for you. You didn't sign my yearbook. Why are the teachers signing each other's yearbooks? So, are you gonna buy me some beer or what? I actually look my character's age. Sadly, she appears to be going out with the preppy kid. If Crispin Glover is Ducky, this guy is definitely James Spader. Are there any more obvious adults we could hang out with? Where's Jack's brother, Billy? Tonight's the night, fellas. Sacrifice of the virgins. Not so loud. Okay, he reacted to that as if he really does think they'll be performing human sacrifices. The two are very close. Jack gives him the support he needs when he flashes those guns in the shower. Every line Jack has is sinister. I stole this from my father. So it's very good stuff. He, he never drinks it. Mm. Go ahead. What if I told you about drugging me, Jack? The boys do what all high schoolers do on a Wednesday in the 80s. Head on over to a whorehouse. Seriously. If they spot Robert Russler and Chris Makepeace, then they'll know for sure it's full of vampires. Jack has first dibs on Louisa. 
Yes, I want you to nibble at my fingers like little rats. Bobby gets the special, though. That's former Miss Nude Universe Kitten Natividad. Wait, no, no, this isn't what Jack signed up for. He didn't know he was going to be the human sacrifice of the night. This is throwing me off. My son's name is Jack, and now I have to take the Witch Crispin Glover will he turn out to be quiz. Already I have the sneaking suspicion this whole sequence doesn't have anything to do with anything. But at least things are happening and not let's have breakfast for five minutes. What kind of place is this? This definitely inspired the comedy classic Euro Trip. And it will totally have the running away screaming shenanigans you'd find in Animal House. <laughs> So, um, that was an opening. Are we actually starting the movie now? Son, I read over your treatment. That whole sequence simply ended with him getting sick and going home. That had no bearing on the plot, son. Anyway, Bobby is flunking French, and his place at Yale is on hold till he takes a makeup exam. It's the relatability of the movie that makes it work. Oh man, gotta take this stupid makeup test. How am I supposed to play 12 hours of tennis now? I hope the tutor at least arrives when I'm shirtless. Hello, Bobby. I'm Terry Green, your French tutor. Because of course she's a French tutor. Hello, it was nice of my dad to find someone who looks exactly my age. Also, his dad worked out a deal that she gets a $10,000 bonus if he passes. Plus, I want you as committed to this as I am. A huge sum in the upcoming sexual harassment lawsuit. I really like Kevin McCarthy's total deadpan delivery here, though. What is so important about Yale? Because I went there. What does Bobby want? He's too young to know what he wants. He's good at this. He delivered that in a way that was straight, but also in on the joke. Some of it is like Joey Tribbiani starred in a movie version of the episode where Phoebe taught him French. I don't really know what the stakes are here. I think Bobby will turn out fine, regardless if he passes the exam. Karen Kay plays Terry the tutor, teaching him the basics of suggestive dialogue. I can tell you're going to work me hard this summer. That's my job. So then I said, you'll work me hard. <laughs> that was great. The boys are still horny, so now they try their luck over at Mel's. Say, you look more like a high school student than our lead. You'll do just fine. And Jack is totally into this. Millions and millions of people are just banging away like crazy. He's a fact of life. That's kind of an awesome thought. I think Jack just wants a large chili cheese fries and call it a night. This puts new meaning to the song, She Works Hard for the Money. Matt Latanzi isn't bad in this. It is just a little unbelievable that he's this virginal character who has to go through great lengths to get laid. The best part of the sex scenes is knowing that Olivia Newton-John actually was there on set for all of them. But they made a mistake. The waitress's fiancé is the leader of a biker gang. He can find a way out of this. All he has to do is have sex sex with her and thrust to the motion of tequila by the champs. That one's for you, Paul. The movie really is a collection of set pieces, not really connected. Here is the now they're escaping from angry bikers sequence, after the now we're running away from prostitutes sequence, and every now and then it's the plot about him needing a tutor, which so far feels like the B-plot. It's like I can't decide on private lessons or Curtis Hansen's losing it. So why not both? Let's take a break. Gotta cut around some nudity again for the totally necessary swimming sequence. Get those maniacs! <laughs> it's the last word about the first time. Losing it. Now that we're back... Clark Kent's ceiling art is really coming together. Also, Bobby is going to thank his dad for paying that extra bonus that the live-in tutor swims naked at the stroke of midnight every night. Oh no, we're not done here yet. I haven't finished. Gonna follow her back to her room. Or if I didn't know this was a comedy, 
I think it was a shot from a stalker thriller. I don't even want to know why Dad felt it necessary to put bars on the windows. But anyway, back to the tutoring. The sinister daydreaming from getting it on has finally arrived and is also tardy. Mm-hmm, definitely into it. She looks miserable even in his fantasy. Maybe he has other problems. He was asked to take a simple 15-minute quiz and instantly fell asleep. Is he okay? Bobby, will you just do the test, please? <sighs> Never mind, he's fine. Control your student! He immediately jumps into the pool to hide the fact that he has an erection. I'm glad you thought of it. Well, then, teacher gets to take a break, too. What? Why is this happening? It is less awkward than private lessons, because the lead doesn't look 12, so I guess I am fine with him looking older. But private lessons made more sense plot-wise, since she was part of a con artist's scheme to seduce the lead. And this movie is about his ADHD is spontaneously jumping into the pool. Here's the next cut after they're done studying. The movie's like, you know what? Let's just watch the opening credits again. Bobby, I knew I'd find you randomly watching girls exercise. Well, have you have you tried to score with her yet? You've never said those words before in your life. I like how even in his first theatrical role, Crispin Glover is still Crispin Glovering the shit out of this. Just uh, you and her alone by the pool. <laughs> Jack, please don't eat my tutor like you did the last one. Good Christ, when they're watching the exercises, Jack is standing there like he should be holding a bottle of barbecue sauce. But anyway, the tutor plot! Bobby got only an 80 on the practice exam. Eh, five points away from passing. On to the field trip where you can really study the language. Now I'm going to teach you a skill that all young men should know. The art of tasting wine. The hell kind of French class is he taking? I suppose the movie needs a villain. Here's rich guy who is just as rich as everyone else in the movie. The sound effects editor gets a little carried away here, and I thank him for it. Not a scratch. Okay, my man? Pierre, how are you? I have no idea if that was intended to be in the movie, but it did get a big laugh out of me. Oh no, this is her ex-boyfriend, Don! Now this one's like moment by moment, only if Lily Tomlin tutored John Travolta. And this really makes up for Alex not having a phone cord and getting it on. Here we get a cord so big, it wrecks the restaurant. And what's this guy's damage? They had to work hard at making him creepier than the lead. Now he's chasing them T-1000 style down the street. Oh no, my tutor fell off the bike! Oh wait, new scene. He spots another girl to be in his daydream, where again, it works if I put in the sinister music. The movie's gonna end with them just putting him on Ritalin, isn't it? The pool is cleaned, so now he can have a fresh new watching the tutor from the trees scene. The movie is half comedy, half lifetime thriller about the preppy killer. The sound effects guy is nearby too. Nice night for a stroll, huh, Bobby? You took it a step too far, sound effects guy. She makes him promise no more spying. Well, okay, but why are you walking around naked outside every night? Tomorrow's a new day and a new plot setup. Oh, it's so hard to decide without setting it all up. It takes an hour to set this tent, ma'am. Guess this is the story we're focusing on now. Oh, okay. It's his mom setting up a tent for his birthday. I didn't know that that was his mom on account of it's her first time appearing in the damn movie. Sorry, Bobby. Don caught up to me, as you can see. Also, his car is fine, which makes that post-production sound effect even more hilarious. And here is an actual cut that really does sum up the whole movie. <laughs> Well, that was five seconds of studying. On to the mud wrestling! 
Bobby, why are you sad? Just because all of our attempts to get laid end horribly. I have a hunch they didn't have the budget to film inside. It cuts to Terry going to Don's house, then cuts back to them being thrown out of the establishment. You're nuts to go jumping in that ring. <laughs> I, I couldn't help myself in the... You jumped in and stuck a knife and fork into her butt cheek, Jack! If you're wondering how it went at Don's, he's caught cheating on Terry again. No shit. Don't get out of the car! Or I'm gonna cut it off and I'm not talking about your house yet! Um, excuse me. Jack needs that to saw through some stripper bone. I doubt she's really safe with anyone. Jack and Billy are, of course, waiting for the mud wrestlers to leave. Um, security? Security! You little turds again. No honest mistake, they just wanted an autograph from director Cat Shea, who was one of the wrestlers. Am I supposed to feel sorry for them? They kinda deserve to get their asses handed to them. Oh, they got away. Um, yay. One more for the road. They actually rip the clothes off of her as they drive by, leaving her in the alley naked. But still, I sure hope he passes the French exam and gets into Yale. The tutor from my tutor feels like she was inserted into the movie. I had a bad night, too. Let me word it differently to make it sound normal. We watched a couple of ladies roll around in the mud and get all wet. <sighs> that made you sound weirder! Anyway, now is the time to tell you I'm thinking a lot about you. You know, now that you're at your most vulnerable. The sad music suggests he really does have feelings for her, but everything else suggests he just simply wants to get laid. She takes it as a compliment, though. Now she goes out naked swimming, knowing full well he'll be watching, and pulls him into the pool. Welp, the script says we should hook up, so I guess that's reason enough. They have nothing in common. There's no chemistry. They've barely had a conversation that's longer than a minute. This really is happening for no reason. It's the first time we make love. Oh, sorry. It's happening because you're legally required to bang when music like that starts playing. I still go back to Unlike Private Lessons. I don't feel like I'm going to jail for watching it. Whoa, wait, we almost forgot about the Bobby's birthday plotline. Get the next scene in here! We've hired the band to do a Gimme Some Lovin' sound-alike for you, son. You don't still want to watch The Graduate instead, do you? And I want to say one word to you, Robert. Computer chips. Well, you should want to watch The Graduate, because we're going to straight up rip off lines from it. But updated, of course. Jack and Billy are dressed in their finest 80s drug lord chic. Dad, you haven't been seen in a while. Get him back in here. He's being portrayed as sleazy for checking out her ass, despite our heroes literally doing the same when Bobby's mom walked away. I still like this dad, though. He just cuts to the chase. I find you very, very attractive. And to come right to the point, I would like to sleep with you. Dad is consistent with his morals, unlike the other characters. You see, I just don't like men that think they can have anything they want just because they have money. You're banging someone who drove away with a mud wrestler's clothes and got to do a makeup test to secure a spot in Yale because he's rich. Granted, it is hard to remember some things. The Bonnie character is back. Remember her? The girl from the beginning of the film who went off with, um, what's his name? Beth? Sure. Come on, nobody's named Biff. Well, Jack hard disagrees. Here, help him forget again by being sleazier than the dad. Would you care to dance with me? No, thank you. And I suppose the whole job is just completely out of the question. <gasps> and that's how that scene ends. These characters are stupid. I'm worried that you're getting the wrong idea. Where would he get the wrong idea? Surely not from you two sleeping together. We don't have the rights to play Set the Night to Music by Jefferson Starship, so we'll just cut to the next morning. I can't lie, it is distracting that she looks a lot like Olivia Newton-John. Like this whole movie is some weird Olivia's exploitation starring her husband. When he goes back to the room, he can pretend to be asleep like he usually is, while his dad walks around pretending to be Powers Booth. 
But the movie still needs its villain, Don's back. We'll call this the fifth plot in the film, though Bruce Bauer, who plays Don, is having some fun in the role. I'm a third degree black belt in karate. I know a hundred different ways to bust you up in seconds. This sequence is pretty funny, too. Wait here. Okay, that was good. Another thing that this does better than getting it on, characters randomly pulling out a gun. And in this one, he actually does shoot at him. Now that the gunplay is done, he goes to get her some sexy clothes where he has to mention their age difference. And how old is she? 30. Ah, okay, so your age. Actually, he's about 24 here, but we all looked 30 back then. Whoop, no time for jokes now. Bonnie's in the movie again. <laughs> we'll be right back. Bye. Columbia Pictures presents Spring Break. It's the reason kids go to college in the first place. We're back, people. Are you kidding with this? Put your, put your, put your knee up there. I can't jerk off to this. Impossible. Witness the hotness of the teaching to have sex scene. And more awkward cuts, too! I'm not sure I want to go to Stanford Law in the fall. Maybe I should just go to Berkeley and take advantage of the in-state tuition break, huh? Who the hell are you two?! Oh, it's the maid and the gardener. Okay, I guess this plot is that the parents are going away for the weekend, so now they have to sneak around the maid. Yeah, they're very concerned about being caught riding around in the open as they yell to Don from the street. Are you and this kid getting it on? Get lost! Getting it on is the other movie! She even screams, he's ten times the lover you are! Which goes into a chase where is he trying to run them down and kill them? Makes sense. Private Lessons had a car chase in it too, but did it have a ramp? I applaud the clever editing since they didn't have the budget to actually show a car jump. Just take it to the same guy who fixed it within minutes from the valet wrecking it. There's 20 minutes left. Continue with the parents gone for the weekend plot. Another reason Risky Business was what I called the best film of 83. It shows you can make a movie with teen sex shenanigans worked into a plot about business and getting into college, and it can be focused, super stylish, with characters that feel real, plus laugh out loud funny and provocative. That's not to say that stuff like this doesn't still serve its purpose, because sometimes you just want to kick back, relax, and watch Hot Dog the Movie. Like, I'm not always in the mood for Halloween. Tonight's a sweet 16 night. And my tutor can be fun for the right occasion. <laughs> that occasion when zany sneaking around music fits the bill. And lines like this. What do you think your parents would say if they could see us right now? They'd say I'm calling the police. It really does feel like the producer saying, make a movie with sex scenes and the older woman fantasy with all the basics. Here's a list of scenes I want you to have. Then they do the scenes and don't connect any of them. So let's throw in an I want to go to a different school plot out of nowhere. What if I went to UCLA instead? All my friends are going there and... Bobby, there isn't any ambition among your friends. Your dad's right. Those friends will 100% hold you back. You can feel the mandated scenes, because every movie like this in the 80s has a dinner scene where they're feeling up on each other under the table. But what is this movie called again? To finish. Je finis. To finish. Oh right, my tutor! Back to the tutoring! Where they make a deal, he does well on the test, and they'll sleep together again. They're still idiots. This is a secret, remember? Let's kiss outside, where Dad can see us! Hard to get mad, though. He got a 91 on his exam! Plus... Hey, muchacho, como esta? 91! They've caught up to losing it and are on their way to Mexico! Um, okay, bye. Did you stop by here for that? Uh, pick me up a cheesy gordita crunch, I guess. Also, right away, Terry wants to bolt and says, I'm going to visit my family in France, implying this character was probably originally going to have an accent. Am I supposed to be sad again? Bobby, I'm not leaving you. 
I'm going away, that's all. She's leaving you, bro. Now get in here, you're both in so much trouble. <laughs> Kidding. His dad is thrilled and says she's earned that $10,000. A little late to introduce a 17th predicament. Now Bobby is pissed, thinking she only slept with him to get a bonus. I wish that was the case. The movie would make a lot more sense if she just straight up said, Yes, I did only sleep with you so you'd pass and I'd get a bonus. Instead, she denies it and he's mad. Why didn't you just talk to me at the beginning, huh? Then we could have made some kind of an arrangement, like with a hooker. How can you say that to me? Because half the people he's met in this movie are hookers. It would be kind of amazing if the movie did end dark, since getting it on didn't give me the last American Virgin ending I wanted. Not that this'll end like that, too. Because what the hell? Is it the ending to Easy Rider? Ah, he's fine. He and Terry don't get back together. Instead, he picks Bonnie. Bonnie, will you go to the movies with me on Saturday night? We can go to the 9.30 Revenge of the Jedi showing. Bonnie is definitely an afterthought to still give Bobby a happy romantic ending. This movie is just him being presented with multiple pathways, and each of them end with him being okay. No Yale? Oh, go to UCLA! No Terry? Oh, get together with Bonnie instead! We've been in three scenes together! Though these two can have a proper goodbye. I'm sorry that I hit you. I wish you would have shot me. I think Alex can arrange that. I'll be thinking about you when I sleep with my next student. I do give the movie props for not having them end up together. Ending up together was one of the million weird things about private lessons. Though of the 1983 movies, it's right there with Staying Alive as having one of the best ending shots, especially for the quick song change. Even Tony Monero would strut to that, and both endings are featured in their trailers. What a double feature that was, and between the My Tudor theme and the video song, both have catchy, memorable tunes. And a great part of watching them now is wondering oh, what in the hell these characters would be up to today, 40 years later. The pseudo-remake My Teacher's Wife doesn't count. Give us legacy sequels to these, damn it. We'll find out if they still use fake IDs to get into the mud wrestling bar. Hey, blow, what's happening, man? All right, all right, cuz. Yeah, please, bro, please. I'm watching my video. I'm watching my video